Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Tamar Mohammed, uh, CEO uh, of uh, Aspect Biosystems. Uh, first and foremost, would like to thank uh, the Alliance of Regenerative Medicine for uh, bringing us all together and, and for giving us that opportunity to share some exciting updates uh, in, in the regenerative medicine community. Uh, so Aspect Biosystems is based in uh, Vancouver, Canada, uh, and we're focused on leveraging our uh, advanced printing technology for the creation of living tissue uh, therapeutics. So Aspect Biosystems uh, was spun out of the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Uh, this was based off of a collaboration between um, uh, world-class research groups in engineering uh, and medicine. Uh, and since we've spun out of the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, uh, we've hit several key commercial milestones. Uh, we built a strong IP portfolio uh, that includes over 40 filings uh, around the world. Uh, we've engaged some of the uh, largest players in the pharma and biotech uh, world, uh, which helps validate uh, our technology and helps us diversify into different applications uh, of our technology. Uh, we brought in smart venture capital to fuel uh, our growth uh, and development, and, and we've assembled a uh, really world-class team of uh, scientists uh, and engineers that uh, are really pushing the boundaries of, uh, of, of the space. And so I don't think I need to uh, spend much time here convincing uh, people in, in a room that uh, are really passionate about regenerative medicine uh, of, of this slide, uh, but really uh, I think it's important to highlight the massive paradigm shifts that we are seeing in the space. Uh, so the way we think about drugs uh, is, is rapidly changing. Small molecules uh, were once mainstream, uh, but now I think we're uh, seeing uh, a rapid advancement towards personalization and, and drugs becoming a lot more biological. Uh, so the market for biologics is, is rapidly uh, advancing, uh, and now I think we're uh, really capitalizing on, on years of advancements in the regenerative medicine space, and, and we're looking at the future of drugs in the forms of cells and, and tissues uh, and one-day organs. Uh, similarly, in the medical device world, we're seeing a massive paradigm shift forward uh, where uh, devices uh, are becoming a lot more personalized uh, and a lot more custom, uh, and so 3D printing is playing a big role there. Uh, and so ultimately, Aspect uh, is playing at this convergent area uh, between these massive paradigm shifts uh, where we're focused on uh, 3D uh, bioprinted living tissue therapeutics. And so to enable uh, the creation uh, of living tissue therapeutics, we're really focused on creating uh, an end-to-end -end solution, uh, which uh, includes uh, our underlying platform technology. So this is a printing technology that's based off of microfluidics. Uh, the biomaterials and cellular inputs that we use, uh, the tissue design uh, software, uh, and importantly, the partnerships that we are forming to focus on different applications uh, of, of our technology. Uh, and so just very briefly, uh, in terms of our commercialization strategy, uh, our platform technology uh, allows us to go uh, after multiple different uh, applications in the tissue engineering space um, and to fully unlock uh, the broad applicability of our platform. Uh, we work very closely with academic researchers uh, around the world. We provide access to our platform uh, technology uh, and in return we get licensing rights off of the tissues that, uh, that are developed uh, on our platform. So this was through our discovery ecosystem that we created uh, last year. And so uh, since we launched that initiative, we have uh, over 12 placements uh, in world-class research labs focusing on applications from uh, kidney tissue to cardiac tissue to neural tissue. And so it allows us to really expand beyond our internal pipeline and uh, to really build a very strong innovation pipeline. Uh, in uh, the company uh, at Aspect, we are advancing very focused uh, therapeutic programs in regenerative medicine where we're creating uh, living tissue uh, therapeutics and we're advancing that as a company. Uh, and we're also partnering very strategically with commercial groups. And so these are uh, biotech companies, medtech companies, as well as uh, material companies on specific uh, applications uh, of our technology. Uh, one of our most recent partnerships uh, that was announced is with GSK and Merck uh, that is focused on oncology, uh, another research uh, application uh, that we uh, embarked on with our partners in, JS in Japan, uh, JSR, for Corporation is focused on liver tissue, uh, ultimately with a view towards liver transplantation. Uh, but today, uh, I'd really like to give an update on uh, two of our therapeutic programs uh, that we are pr advancing. Uh, these are programs that uh, we launched uh, about a year ago uh, in the company and, and we're uh, advancing them. Uh, and so the first application that, that we're pursuing is in the uh, orthopedic space where we're creating a uh, knee meniscus uh, implant for transplantation. Uh, so the knee meniscus, uh, is one of the most important parts uh, of, of the knee. It plays the important role of absorbing shock, uh, but unfortunately it is also one of the most commonly damaged parts. 
uh, of the knee. Uh, and to make matters even worse, once a damage occurs, uh, it doesn't heal well. Uh, the tissue isn't well vascularized. Uh, and so the, the, the problem just gets worse and worse as time goes by. Uh, so current uh, surgical uh, strategies, uh, or uh, rather standard of care, include surgical strategies, uh, including meniscectomies, where the surgeon will go in and try to remove the damaged part, uh, or in some extreme cases, remove the entire meniscus. Uh, this could alleviate the acute pain, but often introduces arthritis in the knee. Uh, and so there's really no good solution uh, to, to this problem. Uh, and so what we're focused on at Aspect uh, is uh, ultimately we see a, a future where if a, a patient suffers from a significantly torn meniscus or a degenerative meniscus, they would go to the hospital. Uh, we take a scan of, the, of their knee. Uh, that patient-specific scan would be sent off-site to a centralized manufacturing site. Uh, and uh, our printers would be there and, and we would be able to 3D print uh, these custom-fit uh, knee meniscus uh, implants. Um, and so using our microfluidic technology, we would recreate that uh, fiber-based architecture, that heterogeneous composition that is so critical to providing the overall function uh, of, of that tissue. That uh, patient-specific tissue would then uh, be shifted back to the hospital, uh, and uh, through an arthroscopic surgery, the surgeon would uh, implant that uh, in, in place of the, uh, the damaged uh, tissue, and, and the patient would be on their path uh, to recovery. Uh, so looking at uh, native meniscus tissue, uh, it is composed of a, a very ordered fiber uh, architecture. And so looking at SEM images of our 3D printed uh, knee meniscal um, uh, implants, you see this very nice uh, organization of these uh, individual uh, fibers, which are so critical to providing the overall function uh, of, of the meniscus and also guiding uh, cell uh, engraftment. We're also able to control the porosity uh, of, these, uh, of these printed uh, implants uh, to, to guide cell engraftment inside of the body. Uh, so earlier this year at the Orthopedic Research Society uh, conference, we uh, presented um, uh, static mechanical testing data to really validate uh, our ability to surgically implant uh, these, these tissues. Uh, and so endpoints that we looked at include suture pullout strength, uh, tensile strength, compressive uh, strength. And so we're able to show that we surpassed the necessary targets for, for all of these uh, endpoints. Then working very closely uh, with um, expert uh, veterinary orthopedic surgeons, we optimized procedures uh, in uh, uh, cadaveric porcine uh, models to actually resect the damaged parts of, of the meniscus. Uh, this is in the avascular zone where 90% of, of the injuries occur. Uh, and then uh, we're able to um, print a partial meniscus implant that fits uh, just, just right, uh, and we're able to fix that uh, into, into the joint. Um, and so if you look at the image on the right, you can see the uh, intact vascular periphery on the outer uh, of parts of that, that structure, and in the uh, uh, in interior zone, you could see the partial meniscal implant sutured uh, in place. And so we started uh, uh, large animal studies. These are uh, ongoing, uh, but looking at uh, early data uh, from, uh, from these studies, uh, we see in the image uh, on, on the left, uh, the yellow arrows point to the intact vascular periphery. Uh, the blue outline shows our uh, meniscus implant that was, um, that was fixated uh, into the joint. Um, if you look closely at the boundary of that meniscal implant, you could see it. the color of it is, is pink, uh, suggesting that blood is rushing in, which is a good sign for uh, cellular engraftment. Um, and then we uh, dissected uh, these, these samples 33 days uh, after, uh, after uh, conducting this uh, the study, and, and our, our goal is to look at uh, retention uh, in, in the joint and the ability of the, the meniscus implant to maintain its shape. And so here we can see that uh, the meniscal uh, implant is able to maintain uh, its shape and its integrity, uh, and we also get retention in the joint. Uh, it's, uh, in other words, it's staying in its place, uh, which, which is really what we were after uh, in this uh, initial proof of concept study. Uh, so we're currently conducting histological assessment, looking at engraftment, looking at vascularization, uh, looking at um, inflammatory uh, response, and, and ultimately uh, uh, looking at uh, uh, larger uh, animal studies over a longer period of, uh, of time. The second uh, therapeutic uh, um, uh, tissue that we are developing at Aspect is a, a pancreatic tissue patch for 
uh, type 1 uh, diabetes. So type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease uh, that involves uh, the immune system targeting and killing the insulin producing beta cells uh, in, in the pancreas. Uh, the disease is diagnosed at a very young age and, and so these patients are not able to produce enough uh, insulin uh, to regulate glucose levels uh, in the blood. Uh, standard of care uh, right now includes insulin uh, in injections. Uh, more recently um, pumps uh, have been uh, introduced by companies like Medtronic um, and so these, these pumps provide uh, a solution along the spectrum to an ultimate cure, uh, but we see specific challenges in that these pumps need to be refilled, they need to be refueled. Uh, but more importantly, looking at the data, these pumps are not nearly as responsive of, of cell therapy. And so working very closely with uh, Professor Tim Kiefer at the University of British Columbia. Uh, Tim Kiefer is a world-renowned expert uh, in stem cell uh, um, derived beta cell uh, development. He was the first to publish a seven-step uh, protocol for taking ESCs and, and turning them to insulin producing cells. Uh, and so he was uh, able to uh, take stage four uh, ESCs, uh, implant them into, uh, into animals, and after eight weeks, they develop into insulin producing cells. Uh, after eight months, uh, if we look at the morphology of the eyelets, they uh, uh, resemble uh, the, the morphology of uh, eyelets in, in human uh, pancreas uh, organs. And so we're working very closely with uh, Tim Kiefer, uh, uh, bringing in his expertise on the stem cell side uh, and, and leveraging our microfluidic uh, approach to printing to uh, number one, handle these very, very sensitive cells and provide an environment that both uh, immune protects these cells, but also gives them an environment that keeps them alive uh, and functional. Uh, and so we're leveraging our core shell technology that we're able to, uh, to uh, um, take advantage of using our microfluidic approach uh, to create this multi-shell uh, architecture. Uh, so in the first shell, we use an alginate-based immune-protecting biomaterial. Uh, in the second shell, we load our therapeutic cells, in this case, the insulin-producing cells. Uh, and then again, in the outer shell, we use uh, an alginate-based immune-protecting uh, biomaterial. Uh, and so this core shell uh, fiber uh, would be printed uh, using uh, our microfluidic printing technology uh, into a 3D architecture, uh, essentially a patch. Uh, and so this patch would be implanted subcutaneously uh, and potentially be retrieved uh, if, if, if necessary. Uh, so in our initial studies, we, we chose to use uh, primary uh, human islets, and so here we show that we're able to print these very uh, sensitive cells, and, and they remain viable uh, in, uh, in our structures. Uh, they also uh, uh, are able to uh, uh, release uh, insulin in, in response to different concentrations uh, of glucose and other uh, pharmacological uh, stimuli. Uh, but if you look at the image on the right, you can see that some of these cells are, are making their way to the edge of, of the fiber, which makes them prone to immune attack. Uh, and so our strategy uh, for this is to encapsulate uh, these cells in uh, core shell fibers where the shell uh, is an immune protecting uh, biomaterial. Uh, now it's very important to be able to control the thickness uh, of that shell so that um, oxygen uh, and nutrients are able to access the core where the highly metabolic cells uh, are, are located. And so using our microfluidic technology, we're able to really dial in and control uh, that microarchitecture uh, and those dimensions. Uh, and so in this uh, experiment, we're able to take highly metabolic uh, MIN6 uh, cells or, or mouse uh, uh, insulinoma beta cell clusters, and we're able to show that we can keep these cells uh, alive uh, in, in our printed uh, structures. Uh, when we look at uh, the comparison of these printed uh, samples versus just uh, non-printed samples, we see that the viability is much, much better in, in our printed uh, structures. In terms of next stages uh, of, of development uh, of, this, of this early program, uh, our plan is to repeat these in vitro studies using the ESC-derived cells uh, that we're accessing uh, through our uh, academic partner, Tim Kiefer, uh, and then we're uh, very quickly going into animal uh, studies uh, in immune competent, immune deficient, uh, as well as uh, STZ-induced uh, uh, diabetic uh, mouse models to look at C-peptide release, to look at uh, uh, immune uh, attack, uh, and, and ultimately glucose regulation. Uh, so I'd like to acknowledge uh, our outstanding team uh, at Aspect. Uh, it's really uh, uh, because of their hard work that we're able to advance and, and make meaningful impacts uh, here. And so uh, with a company like ours, we're ultimately innovating at the cutting edge of material science, uh, 3D printing, and, and biology to come up with uh, truly innovative solutions uh, in the regenerative medicine space. 
so thank you uh, very much for uh, listening to our story, and, and we look forward to keeping you updated and, and meetings to come. Thank you very much.